Stimați telespectatori, bine v-am regăsit la emisiunea Shalom Israel, o emisiune despre istoria, cultura, religia și viața poporului Israel. Mișcarea mesianică în vremurile de azi reprezintă reapariția expresiei evreiești a eclesiei. În cea mai mare parte a istoriei creștinismului, Biserica creștină nu a permis manifestarea în sunul ei a niciunei componente a identității evreiești, a credincioșilor evrei în Iesua, Isus. În această cauză, mișcarea mesianică se consideră pe sine ca o înviere din morți, așa cum scrie în Romani 11 cu 15, despre actuala acceptare de către Dumnezeu a poporului evreu. Inițiativa Toars Jerusalem Council II spre sinodul al doilea de la Ierusalim este o consecință directă a apariției mișcării mesianice moderne, iar viziunea acestei inițiative TGC2 este aceea a reconcilierii evreilor și neamurilor în trupul lui Hristos, Mesia. Altfel spus, viziunea îndeamnă la o acceptare reciprocă între credincioșii evrei și dintre neamuri, personal și corporat. Dar bisericile creștine vor recunoaște legitimitatea și locul credincioșilor evrei în Iesua, Isus, numai dacă au cunoștințe despre mișcarea mesianică și dezvoltă relație cu comunitățile mesianice. De aceea, un rol al TGC2 este de a face cunoscută mișcarea mesianică lumii creștine. Cine sunt de fapt evreii mesianici? Care sunt particularitățile lor? Cum au apărut ei? Ce cred evreii mesianici și ce practică ei? La conferința organizată de mișcarea TGC2 la Seminarul Teologic Ortodox Neans, în zile de 6-9 iulie 2009, am avut privilegiul de a realiza un interviu cu domnul Eyal Friedman, evreu mesianic din Ein Kerem, Israel. Domnia sa este unul din liderii tineri ai mișcării TGC2 spre sinodul al doilea de la Israelim și implicat în dialogul între tinerii credincioși mesianici și tinerii creștini din întreaga lume. Să urmărim acest interviu. Dear friends, welcome to our TV show Shalom Israel. A show about the life, history, culture and religion of Israel. We have the privilege to have as guest today Mr. Eyal Friedman from Israel. Welcome, Mr. Friedman. Thank Friedman. you. It's a privilege to be with you. You came in Romania to participate to a special conference called Towards Jerusalem Council II in the Monastery of Nams. What is the purpose of your coming here today to participate at this conference? Well, I mainly came to represent <clears throat> the Jewish, the Messianic Jewish element of the body of Messiah, as this uh, TJC2 vision uh, has in mind uh, to somehow bring together the different uh, parts of the Church of Christ together with the Messianic Jews, and uh, I'm part of that. What is your connection with TGC2? You are part of the organizers or you are a speaker here? Um, I've been attending these meetings for some years now and I've been following it's very much on my heart. So I try to attend all the conferences, consultations they have, if I can make it. And in this uh, particular conference, um, I was asked also to share some things and uh, Um, yeah, I'm also involved with uh, young people uh, that are interested in TJC too. You mentioned that you are a believer in Yeshua as Mashiach. Um, as we know, there is a certain number of Jews all around the world who in the last uh, years recognize Yeshua as Mashiach. What is your spiritual journey? What determined you to to discover this spiritual truth? Well, I, it started very suddenly, very surprisingly, one day. Um, I was doing my uh, army reserves duty. I was about 24 years old. And at that time I was totally secular. I didn't care so much about religion. Not so much. I didn't care at all about religion. I didn't know anything. I was not searching for God in that sense. Um, I was beginning to have different questions, like uh, different general questions pertaining to the, the meaning of life. Why am I here, etc. And I basically thought 
there are no answers. And that caused me a very deep depression. So then one day, just out of the blue, God intervened in a supernatural way. Um, he did not present himself as God, but what happened to me was uh, I can only describe as uh, something like the light suddenly came on. Um, I all of a sudden had uh, the understanding that there was something more to life than what I was experiencing, uh, hearing, seeing, feeling. There was something beyond. I just suddenly I knew it without a doubt that there was something there. This happened in Israel. It actually. happened in Israel. I was on the beach uh, doing my guard duty. Uh, it was very surprising, but at that time I, was, I, I accepted it as it was. It was something that happened. Uh, it caused me a very uh, strong uh, hung, hunger for spirituality, for spiritual things. And it also gave me a sense of hope, which I did not have before. As I said, uh, I felt there was no meaning to life. I suddenly had a feeling of hope, the, the experience of joy even, uh, beginning to fill me up. Did and you identify this experience like uh, an intervention of God of Israel? Not at all, not at all. Uh, coming from a secular background, I had no idea what it was. I just knew something happened. I just knew that I was hungry. You know, when a baby is born, he doesn't know what mom is, what food is. He's just hungry. He wants to eat. That's what happened to me. I started looking for this thing. I, I, I had to eat spiritually. And um, the Lord really, uh, he was very, very silent. He didn't say a word. He didn't direct me. He didn't show me anything. He just gave me faith and, so to speak, said, okay, go and look for me, something like it's that. It's like somebody touching your yeah. shoulder and say, <laughs> and I turn around, there's no one there. <laughs> but I knew that I had a touch. So this, um, yeah, this actually started my spiritual journey. I started looking in different places. I had uh, my stepmother um, at that time. She was involved uh, with uh, New Age and Buddhism and the, this kind of spirituality. And so I shared my experience with her. She gave me all kinds of books and I started reading. I started eating that food. Uh, which today I know is very bad for you, for your health. In Israel, there are many young people like you trying to find the, the truth everywhere. Yeah, there are many, many, many young people, especially not only young, but mainly young people who are looking for something more to life, especially in the time we're living so in. So you accepted what your mother-in-law offered to you? I did very, very gladly. Very. No mother-in-law, stepmother, you said. Stepmother. And she, she was very happy. I was very happy because I, I started reading and understanding that there's, there's a whole world of spiritual, you know, beings and, and uh, things happening in the spirit. And um, yeah, it caused me joy in the beginning. And as the journey uh, progressed and yeah, I started looking in different places. I uh, even went to India uh, to inquire a little bit into Hinduism, Buddhism. Uh, I attended many courses. I read many, many books. And it was a sincere search. It was a very sincere search. I can, I can say it was something like, it was a feeling I had that I cannot really start living until I find this, this thing, like a foundation for my life. And uh, I had no peace until I found it. Even in India, when I went there, I didn't enjoy for one second what was happening around me because I was so focused on finding this thing. It was such an intensive 
urgency in me to find this truth. It's interesting because I know that many young Jewish uh, boy, boys and girl, girls travel to India to find the true truth, but the God of all the universe revealed to Israel, this is not strange. It is very strange. You know, when I was searching for the truth, I, I even for one second did not even think about uh, looking in Judaism. I, I saw the religious Jews, which for me represented Judaism. I know there are different streams in Judaism, but for me, the Orthodox Jews represented um, Judaism for me. And um, I looked at them and something in me said, no, it cannot be that. It cannot be that. So I just, you know, I kept it aside. I, I didn't even touch it. And so I, I turned to other things, other gods, other religions. And um, yeah, during this whole period of time, this journey, the Lord, even though he was very silent, he was also very faithful in very gently drawing me to himself. I'll give you an example. When I was in the States, I watched a film on television called uh, The Last Temptation of Christ, which is a very bad film. It's very, very It's perverted. a blasphemous movie. Yes, it is. But there are some scenes there that are taken from the Bible, from the New Testament. And I was, I was glued to the screen. I couldn't take my eyes off this man, of this person. There was something drawing me so strongly to him. The next day there was a rerun and I watched it like with the same intensity. I was, really, I was uh, hypnotized by, the, by this, the, the person. But it was, you know, it was, it was something of the heart. I didn't think about that. I didn't think about, you know, the fact that this is Jesus. I was just fascinated by, by this thing. It the was, story. The story, but the person. It was something very strange because I didn't connect what was happening to me. The Lord was drawing me, but in my mind, I was totally unaware of what was happening. Uh, I was, uh, when I looked at the cross, I was just standing there and, and, and staring at the cross, not understanding why. But it didn't cause me, let's say, to, to find a New Testament and read it. It didn't. So, the, I would say the, the real turning point in my search came when I, after I searched for quite a while, maybe three years, and I went into many, many, many things. Uh, I became so confused. You know, this one says, says this, the other one says that. So what is the truth? Was, is was there only a, truth? a philosophical or a spiritual search, but or also some mystical or involved in some demonic? It, I mean, everything that is not of Yeshua involves demons, especially if you speak about spiritual things. Like in Buddhism, you have to commit yourself to the Buddha. Okay, so this is a spirit. Um, there are many things. Like I said, my, my stepmother, she was um, very much into the occult. And she, she actually had powers. She had powers. She used to... Occult powers. Yeah. She used to do, you know, uh, tarot, palm readings, all kinds of stuff. And, uh, of course, this involves evil spirits. And she was, you know, reading in the coffee, all kinds of stuff. So I was involved in it. I was, I wanted, I was very much uh, interested in these things and practicing some things because I was genuinely looking for something to, to hold on to. And uh, going back to the, the turning point in my life, it came at a very low point when I was very, very, even depressed more than I was before. I was at that time already using drugs uh, to fill the emptiness because as much as I thought in my mind that I was, you know, getting higher on the spiritual ladder, get, uh, um, getting more knowledge, 
in my heart. This is the, the old lie of knowledge, of knowledge. Yes, my heart was empty. I, I felt my, the same weaknesses I had before, even worse. Uh, my depression was worse. Uh, my dependency on drugs was very strong. Pornography, I was very much into that. Just trying to, f to fill my life with something because the emptiness grew so, so intensely. So, one day I said, enough, enough, I cannot take it anymore. And there came this cry in my heart. And um, it was not even uh, aimed at God very consciously. It was just aimed at something bigger than me. And this cry just said, help me, help me. And, uh, and that's it. The next day, I was taking my dog for a walk, and two guys come up to me, start speaking to me about God, about faith, about, about Yeshua, Jesus. And um, yeah, we kind of connected, clicked, and um, they started inviting me. They, they uh, belong to a, a community in Jerusalem, a community of believers from Switzerland. And they evangelize among the Jews, among the Arabs, and trying to re bring reconciliation between the two people. And um, yeah, they started, uh, you know, sharing sharing the gospel with me, showing me films about Yeshua. But not before of your own requests, your personal requests of help. No, no, that came after. Only after. I, you know, it's it's amazing how the Lord is waiting for us to call upon Him. The moment I said, "Help me," He was right there, sending them. Yeah, and. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, how, that's how it started. I started reading the New Testament. I was amazed to find that it was all taking place in Israel, Galilee, Judea, Jerusalem, Pharisees, Sadducees. It was all so Jewish, so familiar in a way, because I, w I was brought up secular. And, um, but it was very, very difficult for me um, to understand this the whole, the whole concept of God, the God of the Bible, was so foreign to me, coming from my background, that I was really struggling to understand very basic issues like uh, righteousness, holiness, uh, judgment. You know, in, in, in New Age, it's all peace and love, and you know, you, you, you meditate and you come into nothingness. No responsibility. Nothing. So it was very difficult for me to make this switch in my mind. And um, in one of the, the meetings of this community, we kept in touch. They invited me to their meetings. In one of the meetings, I met Benjamin Berger, who is a, a, a Messianic Jew. He's a leader in, in Israel and Jerusalem. And uh, he shared his testimony and how the Lord Yeshua revealed himself to him. And I figured, yes, he can answer my questions. He's a Jew. He had a real experience. Um, I didn't question for one second his, the, the validity of, of, his, of his testimony. I, I looked in his eyes and I, I could see he was telling the truth. And so I came over to him, I asked different things. Uh, he tried to explain. It was very difficult for me. Anyway, to make a long story short, the connection between us was made. After a while, he invited me to, to come and live with him and his brother in a community they have. And um, after reading the scriptures, we were studying the, the scriptures very seriously, very deeply. After a while, I had to, to acknowledge to myself that, you know what, this is it. As, as strange as it may sound, that Yeshua is the truth. Is the Messiah. Is the Messiah. What and is the significance for, for a Jew to discover this? Because as you know, the majority of Jewish people are waiting for the Messiah to come. 
Yeah. Yeah, suddenly we realized that Messiah already came. Um, I actually, you know, I, I looked, my search was very, very personal. I, I didn't really think about my people, how they related to, to Yeshua. In a way, I didn't care. You know, I just followed my, my need for, for the truth. You had too much problems yourself to care the problems of others. Yes, and also I wasn't even you know, aware of the fact. In a way, I know that the Jews reject Yeshua as Messiah, but I didn't really care. What meant, what, what, what I uh, very, very urgently needed is to find the truth for my own, for myself. After this discovering, how was your life? Because in Israel, the majority of people rejected Yeshua as the Messiah. Yeah, well, first of all, it was difficult for my family because although they were used to my trying different things and doing crazy stuff, uh, they could feel that this was different. You know, when, always when it comes to Yeshua, because it is the truth, because He is the truth, there is a reaction. If it's Buddha, okay. If it's, I don't know, something else, even Islam, you know. <laughs> okay, he's a crazy guy, but, but when it comes it's to our, Yeshua. It's our. Yeah. <laughs> when it comes to Yeshua, then the real opposition manifests itself. What we might, with my family, they were more concerned about me personally. Um, because of my past depression, etc., they were more concerned, especially as I moved to live in this community, which is a rather closed community. They were, they thought it might be a sect or a cult or something strange, and um, they were a little concerned. And they they tried to convince me to leave, but uh, like like it was uh, with my relationship to my people, it was the same with my family. I, I didn't care what they thought, what they, what they... In a way, it's, it's kind of uh, selfish or egoistic, but I knew this was more important for me uh, than my family. And um, it, it, it was difficult also with my friends, you know, because uh, after coming to understand that Yeshua is the Messiah, and uh, my life started to change. Things, uh, past habits I had, drugs, music, different things, I had to, to stop. What happened with, with all this yeah, stuff? Yeah, that, that stuff, uh, it disappeared. I mean, gradually, it wasn't like a clear cut. It took time. But uh, with my friends, you know, I started speaking to them about Yeshua, and they grew tired of that. And I grew tired of them speaking about things that once uh, interested me. M the music of the world, uh, we used to smoke drugs together, that I didn't do anymore after a while. So our parts, our, our paths somehow separated, and each one went his own way. He became part of a special community, as I learned, of celibates. It's quite unique in Israel, as I learned from uh, Benjamin Berger. Um, what makes so special this community and attracting you as a young man to join and to live this, uh, this life? I cannot say that um, the community attracted me or the calling for celibacy attracted me. It was more like I was, I was looking to God, I was looking for the truth. And the Lord, to this day, I don't know how I ended up in this community, to tell you the truth. It just, you know, the Lord, you know how you put blinds to the horses so they just walk straight? That's how the Lord dealt with me. He, he somehow, I don't know how it happened. I ended up in this community suddenly. And uh, I came to the realization that Yeshua is the Messiah. I, at first, I didn't even pay attention to the fact that these two brothers were celibates, you know. 
it was, you know, the way it was. After a while, I started, you know, asking the question, hey, these guys are not married. What's happening here? And um, there came a question in my own life, you know, what, what about me? Uh, but this, I, I believe God put this desire or calling upon my life from the beginning, from my birth, because even in Buddhism, when I was interested in Buddhism, I was really thinking about becoming a monk, a Buddhist monk. So this um, somehow call was, was there. And uh, when I started asking the Lord, I know most people, uh, messianics, they, they don't ask the Lord, do you want me to marry? They ask normally, who do you want me to marry? You know? But I had the question, God, do you want me to get married? And um, the Lord is faithful. If you ask him, he answers. So he started speaking to me about this. And um, there are some very clear verses from the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 19 where Yeshua speaks about those who make themselves as eunuchs for the sake of God's kingdom. When I, re when I read that, and then he, he goes on to say, not everyone understands this, but whoever is able to receive it, let him receive. And I was thinking, first of all, I do understand it, that it is a valid calling from God, and I think I'm able to receive it, you know, but I needed more confirmations, and that came later. And for me, the, the actual point in my life when I could say yes to the Lord in this area was when I came to the point of understanding and knowing, more than understanding, knowing that he will be enough for me. Because at first I wasn't sure, you know, is he enough? Will he satisfy all my needs? Will he fulfill me completely? And when I came to the knowledge that he will, I was able to say yes. And uh, yeah, we had kind of a ceremony where I dedicated my life to the Lord. And it was a, a twofold commitment. One was to the Lord, not to marry. And the other aspect of this commitment was to the community, because I knew that this sort of calling, you cannot live by yourself. You just can't. You need brothers and sisters who share the same calling, whom you can live with and uh, share this life in Yeshua. This reminds me of something related with John the Baptist. Uh, many scholars presume that he belongs to the Essenians, this community of celibates that waited for the appearance of Messiah and uh, actually they had the role to prepare in some way the return or the appearance of, 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 uh, of Yeshua. Uh, it's possible that this kind of communal life and as you live now to be a revival of this old style of life of, of Jewish people during Jesus' time? Um, it's possible, you know, in, in the, the historical churches, this calling is very, very normal. But um, not in the, in the not Jewish in the, people? Not only in the Jewish messianic movement, even in the evangelical circles, Pentecostal, this calling is, is not so much accepted. And, um, you know, when it could be, it could be, a beginning of, of uh, a resurrection of this, uh, of this kind of uh, spirituality, of communal life. Um, when, when we received the calling, both Benjamin Ruven and myself, we, we were not thinking about this. We were just asking God, oh, God, what do you want of us? And he answered, and by his grace, we responded positively. And um, we, we know that we are we will not remain three. You know, we are sure that the Lord has more whom he's calling for this uh, life of celibacy. 
And uh, we are, yes, are called to, to prepare the way, to open this door that has been closed for so many years. How you became involved in the Towards Jerusalem Council to movement and what this means to you? Um, I heard about the movement from Benjamin. Uh, he attended one of the European consultations of TJC2 and uh, when he came back home he told me about it and immediately, just immediately, I knew this was from God and this is very special, very, very special. And it has been on my heart from the beginning, the whole issue of, of the unity of, of the body of Messiah, uh, reconciliation in Messiah. So when I heard about the vision, I knew this was something for me. And um, How do you describe, how to perceive the vision of TGC2 towards Jerusalem Council? To the vision of TJC2 is basically the reverse order of, of the First Council, which we read about in Acts chapter 15. And at this time of uh, this stage of history, as um, most of the believers in Yeshua are from the nations of a Gentile descent, and the Messianic Jews are, so to speak, coming back to the scene. The re-emergence of the Messianic movement is happening all over. Um, I would say the, um, the main uh, vision of, of the TJC2 movement is to recognize the, the, the Messianic Jewish movement as something uh, legitimate, as something uh, that is coming from God, and uh, that the Jews who believe in Yeshua are not to assimilate or um, lose their identity as Jews believing in Yeshua. Uh, I, I personally believe that uh, the vision is much broader than this, and that the Lord will use this movement to actually reconcile the whole body of, of Messiah together, to, to bring it into unity, because Yeshua speaks very, very clearly about his desire that those who follow him will be one. So the vision become part of your own life. And now what is your action towards the fulfillment of this vision? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm part of, of TJC2 in different ways. Um, first of all, in prayer. That's uh, very important. If you believe something, you have to pray for it. Uh, secondly, I try to attend the meetings and be involved as much as I can. Thirdly, um, I'm also involved in the um, uh, younger generation of TJC2, uh, young leaders who were invited by the uh, the, the older ones to take part, to somehow catch the vision and run with it. And so I'm involved also with, with the young generation of, of leaders of TJC2. And uh, yeah, we meet, uh, we, uh, it's, it's something new, it's, it's just beginning to happen. And um, yeah, there's, there's a lot to be done as, as the younger generation. You mentioned this understanding that the Torah Jerusalem Council to movement can have a role in unifying the Messianic body with the Church of the Gentiles. Um, what is the role of the young generation in this, in this call? Yeah, the young generation, I would, I would start with the role of the older generation. Uh, the older generation has opened or opened the door, prepared the way. Uh, they've done many things already uh, so that we as younger generation will have it more easy, you know, to, to come together. Like when the first time we came together as a younger group, the, 
you know, we, we came together, we understood, we have the same vision, that the Lord was calling us, and we, there was such a, a, a unity among us, and we know that this is the work of our fathers in the Lord, who prepared the way and who already worked in that direction. And they, they went through a lot, many challenges, a lot of repentance to one another. And so we as younger generation, I believe, are called to, to really carry the vision further. Uh, the older generation, of course, most of, or all of the, the, the members of the executive committee of TJC2 are very, very recognized and uh, respected leaders in the universal body of Messiah, and all of them are very, very busy. Plus, uh, I don't think they, they have the, uh, the ability to reach the younger generation so much. I'm sure they have. I know that Pat, Father uh, Peter Hawken has a lot of influence on many young people. But as, as, as young people, we, you know, we, we have friends, we serve, we have ministries among the younger people, and we can spread the vision in our own circles. And um, yeah, the children are always called to go further than the fathers. And uh, that's how it goes. You know, Joshua brought the people into the promised land, which Moses didn't. Yeah, different times, different jobs. Exactly. Uh, what is your understanding and vision regarding the future of the Messianic movement? The future? The large. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not an easy thing. The Messianic movement is, you know, it's only, it's only beginning. It's, um, it's, it's in, an, in its infant, infant, infantry? What do you, how do you call it? Infancy. Infancy. <laughs> Infancy. <laughs> yeah, we're a very young movement and there are many, many challenges that we have to overcome. Many, many uh, difficulties. Um, many of us are still immature in many ways. Uh, there's a, a long way to go. But um, I would say the, the main role of the Messianic movement would be First, to be a testimony to the Jewish people about Yeshua, that he is the true Messiah, that he is the only way to God. And um, secondly, to the church at large, uh, because the, the Jewish people have a calling from God to be a priestly nation. And uh, one of the tasks of the priests was to bring the people together. And plus the, <clears throat> the role of Jerusalem as, as a unifying factor in the plan of God. And as Jews living in Israel, in Jerusalem, there's a lot of responsibility on us um, to somehow bring the people of God together to be some kind of mediators. And you can see it already happening in TJC too. The, the, the whole vision was focused on recognizing the Jewish part in the body. In the process of doing that, many uh, unsolved issues, past issues, like um, different strifes between different church denominations were somehow addressed and there was repentance, there was reconciliation. So you can see that there is this blessing on the, on the Jewish people of, of bringing the people of God together. It's not that your first time coming to Romania, it's the second time? The second, yes. Now you are part of this conference, uh, Tars Jerusalem Council to in the Monastery of Nemtz. What is the, your opinion about what's happened during these days here? Um, I'm, you know, I'm, in a way, I'm a little sad because the participation was not so great. In a way, there, I think last year there were more people. Um, I hope next, week, next year there will be more. Um, 
but I'm thankful for those who are here. And um, I was very touched, uh, for example, by uh, Bishop Daniel yesterday in his speech and his willingness to, to truly be a, a bridge between the Jews, the Messianic Jews, and the Orthodox Church. Um, his openness, uh, even his understanding, uh, deep understanding uh, regards the, with regards to the, um, the calling of, of the Jews, uh, the place of the Messianic Jews in the larger body. I was very impressed. And um, of course, every time we come together and we share and we discuss things that are important, we touch uh, delicate issues, uh, it's always good. It's always, uh, it bears fruit. Um, in terms of this relationship of the Messianic movement, and uh, the historical churches, Orthodox and Catholics. But how do you see the development of this relationship in the next years? Um, I'm very uh, hopeful. Um, even last year, we met some uh, Orthodox priests, some people who are very much respected in, in the Orthodox Church, who showed uh, a lot of openness to the Messianic movement. Uh, many of them were rather ignorant of it. They didn't know so much. Um, we had to introduce ourselves to tell uh, who we are and what God was doing among the Jewish people. But I can really say, and especially in Romania, we've encountered uh, a very generous spirit and a very open heart uh, among the, the Orthodox Church. Now with the um, Catholic Church, we've, we've had already a lot of contacts, uh, much more than with the Orthodox Church. Uh, we've been meeting with many, many uh, people from the Catholic Church, even on a very high level. And um, also there, there is a growing um, awareness of what God is doing among the Jewish people, a growing awareness of the importance of the messianic part of the body. And so I'm very, very encouraged. I can see that the Lord is, is really moving uh, in the hearts of many people and uh, preparing something. As you mentioned before, there is a price would call of the Jewish people at large to introduce God to the people, to the nations. Do you consider that this approach of the Messianic movement towards the historical churches and Protestant churches is part of this call of God to represent Him in every, every nation, unifying the body of Christ? How do you sense? Because it's much easier for you to stay in uh, NKRM and to meditate and it's much easier, but you know, when God calls you to do something, you have to obey. You have to obey and you have to pay the price. And for me, actually, it's not so much paying the price because I enjoy it so much. So <laughs> for me, it's a joy to do that because it's very much on my heart to, you know, to reach out to everyone who is open, everyone who is ready. Uh, a pr you know, a, a priestly calling someone who is called to be uh, to live a priestly kind of, of calling is called to, to reach out. Uh, it goes both ways, you know, you reach out to God and you reach out to the people. And um, you must do that. Of course it's easier to stay in Enkaram, but I have this uh, fire in my heart pushing me. To, to reach out, to, to try to, to bring the people of God together, to gather the people of God. There are many young people who are watching us uh, during this show. Um, we have, everybody of us as believers in the show, we have a message in our heart that we like to share with as many people as possible. Um, what is your personal message for the young generation? As a Jew believer, in Yeshua as my share. 
Um, I would say it doesn't have so much to do with my Jewishness, but uh, it is, uh, you know, what is written on my ring of my dedication. At first, I didn't want anything written on my ring. And Brentamin said, pray about it. I did, and immediately, whoosh, this verse came to me. And uh, for me, it's a key verse, and it's, it's a way of life. And what it says is, it's the words of, of Yeshua in Gethsemane. It says, not my will be done, but yours. So it is something for every believer. And if, we, if you really want to be a disciple of Messiah, Yeshua said it very clearly. You have to deny yourself. You have to carry the cross and follow him. And this is, this is you know, it's swimming against the, the, the flow, against the, the current. It's not easy because um, it's much easier to follow the way of the world, to, to make money, to have influence, uh, to, you know, to have fun. This is not what the Lord is calling us, I believe. I believe he is calling us to be radical disciples of, of himself. And that means to pay the price. Now the price is high, the price is everything. You cannot leave anything to yourself because if you belong to him, then you belong to him 100%. And you have to give your whole heart, your strength, your gifts, everything you have, you have to give to him. And then there's the way of the cross. You know, you, you cannot continue with your own uh, desires, dreams, wishes. You have to give it all to him. All these things have to die in order for you to receive what he has for you. And this is the way that leads to life. This show is watched by many by Romanians because Credo TV is addressed mainly to the Romanians in our country and abroad. May you address from your heart the words to our viewers? In please. Romania? No. <laughs> For the Romanians. For the Romanians? Yes. What can I say? I, I'm privileged to be in Romania. I come to understand more and more the, the importance of Romania as a, a Christian country as a, um, a very important country in God's plan, even like I shared with, uh, with you about um, the openness that I can feel in the, um, in the Orthodox Church, I believe that Roma Romania is uh, a door opener, that the Romanian people are called to open the door, uh, at least in this area. And I'm very thankful, I'm very, I was su very surprised last year to, to find that out and uh, to meet brothers, sisters from Romania, see their heart and see their devotion, dedication. Um, I, I go, even here in Neamts, I, I go into the, the chapel here and I, I can feel the love and the devotion of the people to God. And, that is very impressive and that is something that I can personally take home with me. So I, I thank you for that. Mr. Friedman, thank you for coming. It's a pleasure. With us in the show, sharing from your life experience and from your heart. I sense it that you reconcile with God and with yourself. And uh, by divine intervention you find finally the peace. Peace of the world who is Yeshua. Amen. May the Lord bless you. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. May the Lord bless you all. Shalom, Romania. Shalom, Israel. În întreaga lume, mulți evrei, aflați în contexte diferite, mărturisesc aceeași transformare radicală a vieții lor 
în urma unei revelații supranaturale a lui Dumnezeu. Mai mult, în urma căutorilor lor de a găsi sursa acestei revelații, ei ajung la concluzia că Iesua din Nazaret este Mesia lui Israel. Mărturia domnului Eyal Friedman este greitoare în acest sens. Un semn scatologic se arată din ce în ce mai puternic în zilele noastre. Evreii se întorc la Domnul și Mântuitorul Lumii, care este Mesia lui Israel, născut în urmă cu 2000 de ani în Betleemul din Iudeea. Dacă doriți să cunoașteți mai multe informații despre mișcarea TGC2, vă rugăm să ne contactați direct sau prin e-mail. Până la emisiunea următoare, vă dorim din toată inima, Shalom România, Shalom Israel! Thank you.